This is Elizabeth Melton. I'm the Public Engagement Director for the Institute for Diversity and Civic Life, and I'm conducting interviews with the Luce Foundation's COVID-19 Emergency Grant Network for the Grounded Knowledge Project. We are meeting in the Fetzer Institute boardroom in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Andrew Davis is our videographer. Today is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, and I am joined by Jonathan Van Antwerpen. Jonathan, can you introduce yourself for us? Sure, and thank you, Elizabeth and Andrew, for your work on this project, which is um, of great value to me. Uh, as the program director for the Religion and Theology program at the Henry Luce Foundation, um, position I've been in for going on nine years now. Um, and by virtue of that role, uh, every year, I recommend grants to the Luce Foundation's board um, and in 2020, um, that took a new twist um, in response to the pandemic. And that in part is how we ended up here today. Yeah, I would love to hear more just about the context of how the Rapid Relief Grant Initiative came to be. Uh, what did that look like and, and how, did it, how did it unfold? Yeah, I think first I would just say one note about nomenclature which is that there's a lot of different formulations of what this initiative even was. Um, sometimes the grants were referred to as emergency grants or urgent needs grants. Rapid relief, I think, was a formulation that was used by some of the grantees. Um, as I've thought about this this past spring, uh, I was drawn back to March. Um, March 5, I remember was the last day that I spent in the Luce Foundation's office in Manhattan. <clears throat> and I, I, would, I recalled that when we went back to the office over a year later. And on my desk was uh, a, a sheet of paper with some handwritten notes. And at the top, I'd written a date. So in New York, you know, we went um, pretty quickly into um, sheltering in place, um, locking down. There were different formulations for what it was we were doing. And uh, I was at home um, through March and, and April, celebrated my birthday by Zoom, um, and home with my, my partner um, and my two young children. My youngest was just over a year old at that time. They were both home from preschool, which had also been closed. So Personally, that was the context for me. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to work from home. You know, um, to Our office closed, and we began to meet regularly by Zoom. We had a relatively new uh, president at the Luce Foundation, Dr. Mariko Silver, had arrived um, not long before the pandemic lockdowns began. And she pretty quickly had the full staff and then our program directors meeting regularly by Zoom, um, which was a certain form of community in those early days. Um, and we would share personal updates, <laughs> more personal than we would usually share during staff meetings in the office, uh, as well as just updates on our unfolding work. And so through her leadership uh, and engagement with our board, um, she was able to secure a commitment to do some, what we initially called emergency grant making. And in the context of our American art program, for example, which works a lot with cultural institutions, which were deeply affected by the pandemic in the early days in, in particular, um, because their the revenue models de depend so heavily on people coming through their doors, um, our grant making shifted just to provide support for those institutions so that the, the effect on their staffing, for example, would be more limited than it would have otherwise been. Um, Monica also encouraged me to think about ways that, given the religion and theology program's work um, and the partners that we worked with through our grant making, we might be able to do some unusual kind of grant making um, working with partners. So it was at her encouragement um, that I began to think, well, what could we do? And looking at the grantees that we had, um, a number of them in um, theological education institutions, independent seminaries, 
um, divinity schools embedded in universities, as well as as well as university-based centers and departments, um, we realized that these grantees, in many instances, already had relationships with community organizations that were um, working with uh, vulnerable populations. And in the early period, there was also a discussion in philanthropy um, about and commitment on the part of philanthropies, at least in in word, um, to doing what, what they could to uh, address the needs of particularly vulnerable uh, populations and communities. Um, and so it was out of that context that we open a set of conversations with existing grantees, so um, schools that had uh, grants that were active with the Loose Foundation or had recently been active, uh, where we had some relationship and could move to them quite quickly, um, and invited them to think about whether they would be able to receive a grant mm -hmm. and use um, that grant for two purposes. One, to provide some form of direct support for community-based partners who were working um, with vulnerable communities, communities that were likely, it was already clear to be more hard hit by the pandemic. That became pretty clear early on, uh, and then only deepened in terms of the public understanding of the differential effects of the pandemic through the late spring and on into the summer. And that's another story. Um, we were able to open these conversations and then, and then saw a really amazing response. There was an eagerness and a hunger that you probably heard about from these grantee partners of ours um, to be able to do something. Because many of us were home. Um, I remember some of the early conversations I had running around the front yard of my um, home chasing my children around, <laughs> uh, talking to Harold Morales at Morgan State University, who also was grappling with his own um, you know, significantly changed domestic situation and working from home and um, attending to his children. And so, um, and at the same time, others were experiencing the pandemic um, in deeply unsettling ways. It was dislocating, um, disconnecting, and this seemed to offer um, an opportunity to do something novel to provide that direct support and in part because of the, the knowledge making communities that we primarily work with, to do something to uplift the voices of the communities that would be supported um, through documentary work, oral history, um, media projects of other kinds, um, artistic, uh, artistic work um, in collaboration with communities. And so those two pieces of the of the initial emergency grant making or urgent needs grant making as we later came to call it um, were features of each of the grants that we we began to unfold and we we um, we did it outside of our normal um, mode of, of operating procedures so at the foundation where I worked the Henry Luce Foundation typically the majority of our grants go through um, a process of a board review and approval we have a board of directors to whom our program directors recommend grants on a, on a cycle every year. And all of these grants um, were, um, with board approval in advance, were accelerated through a process that didn't involve our typical proposal development process and also didn't involve the same kind of board review so we could make them very quickly. So off we went. And it was um, April and May that the first round of grants went out. The very first one was to Vanderbilt University Divinity School, where the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative had been a major partner for um, our work on religion. And, um, and then from there, um, developed relationships with um, another, initially nine or 10 um, partners. Thank you for sharing that kind of context. It's, yeah, it's been interesting to hear the, the stories people share about um, the ways in which they were able to move forward without even fully knowing what they were going to do with the money, but how grateful they were for that openness um, and that ability to, to really listen to the communities that they, they were going to be working with. Um, I'm wondering, too, with 
you know, there was so much that was unknown, so much that we were unsure about in those early days of the pandemic, those first several months. Um, I'm wondering what kind of expectations or dreams or hopes you had about the potential um, for these grants. Um, did, did you have an idea of what, what could be possible? Um, or were you fully surprised at, at what ended up getting done and what people were able to accomplish? You know, I think that honestly, we were making it up as we went along. And you know, in my own experience, prior to working in philanthropy, I found that some of the most exciting work that I ended up doing took that form. And I had been a grantee of the Luce Foundation. Um, and they had given us, when I was at the Social Science Research Council directing this program on religion and the public sphere, which grew out of an, an initial grant from Luce and then some other work that we developed, they had given us latitude to, to, as we came to call it during the pandemic, to pivot, to adjust course, um, to dream up new things along the way, and then in conversation with the foundation to be given, not permission exactly, but encouragement to pursue those things. So I'd had the experience of doing things that I hadn't initially set out to do that ended up getting traction, exciting others, and being meaningful, um, making an impact, <laughs> as um, folks in philanthropy like, sometimes like to say. Um, and so I think you know, as we set out to do this, I was really just following the lead of our president who said, look, we need to you know, we do something different. This is a big enough um, disruptive moment that um, what can we do? And so I just tried to, as we do in our work, um, draw on the insights of our grantees. So I got on the phone with each of them. Um, and it began, I think, probably with just some emails waited for those responses, which came back really quickly, and then said, and just opened the conversation and said, what do you think? Is this, would this be feasible? It was something very different than, I think, anything the Luce Foundation had ever done. I think maybe in the early period, if you look back at some of the earlier grant-making, Luce's, um, a foundation that was established in the 1930s, did have some relationships with, with organizations and institutions in, in the earlier period that might have in some instances, um, provided support that looked different than what we were providing um, at this moment when, when we made this pivot in response to the pandemic. But by and large, Luce has been and continues to be a knowledge foundation. We work with knowledge institutions um, like universities, seminaries, art museums, policy institutes, media organizations, and, and increasingly a range of other knowledge makers. Um, we do not provide direct support. We do not provide um, the kind of aid that's associated with response to um, disasters, um, natural or otherwise. Um, we, we do not provide that kind of humanitarian assistance. And so the, this um, grant making was just outside our comfort zone. So initially it was just, OK, what is this going to look like? Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't think that we had a, a well-developed set of expectations beyond the desire to be able to do something con to contribute to a, a wider collective effort that was taking many different forms. And this was a relatively small contribution to that. And I think a good reminder that we, all of our work is not done in isolation. You know, we, we, we make grants. Uh, we have the privilege of, of moving funds to individual organizations that have a significant impact on individuals that, that, um, whose professional trajectories, in some cases life trajectories, are changed by those grants. But in terms of the, the wider um, goals that we set for our work or the wider goals that the organizations that we work with set for their work, in terms of the way that we formulate our mission um, in these lofty terms, our actual contribution to the pursuit of a more, as our new mission statement puts it, a more democratic and just world is just one part of a much wider set of efforts. And so in that sense, I think the ambition was just to be part of that response 
to the pandemic and to do what we could based on the relationships that we had in place and the resources that we had available to us. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting hearing this kind of context and putting it into conversation with, with the other responses we've been hearing as well from, from the, the other, the scholars, the folks kind of leading these initiatives, um, the, the, the pastors, the theologians, and that we're at, it seems we're at a pivotal moment, that pivot again, but a pivotal moment um, where things maybe need to shift a little bit in how they're working. And so this was a unique opportunity to bring in that full self um, and, and break down some of those boundaries perhaps that we, we typically put up as, as academics or scholars or researchers. Um, so it seems like it's been really impactful in that way and in the way of you know impacting individual lives and the, the type of relief work they were able to do. Um, I'm wondering with, as, as you started hearing and, and seeing what people were able to do with these grants, um, what was your response? Were, were you surprised? Were you, um, was there a moment of, of hope and lightness that came in um, as, as you were able to, to see what, what this initiative mm. was capable of doing? It was moving. I was inspired, you know. Um, I mean, I think this is a lot of what I feel ultimately in, in the best of the work that we do is just grateful to have the opportunity to support the folks that we support. And I feel that about all the grant making. I feel lucky to be aligned with the, um, the work that we support um, in terms of my own values and commitments. Um, but in this pandemic moment, it, and in the early, early days of the pandemic in particular, um, it was, and I, I, I also received these words of gratitude from the grantees themselves. That was one of the, I think, one of the recurrent themes as we stayed in conversation with them through the efforts of uh, PRI, who helped convene this regular meeting of the, of the network that was established by Zoom um, with grantees at all different sites throughout the country. Um, they got together regularly, as I'm sure you've heard, um, in these monthly Zoom meetings. And there were logistical issues that were being addressed, um, but also just a, a kind of sense of gratitude to be able to, to do the work. And so I was, I was moved by that, um, in, inspired by it, and kind of, yeah, in addition, wondering, okay, what is this going to mean for our work? Um, and I think that's what we're still unfolding. I think the work of the project that you're participating in is, is in some way, uh, in addition to an attempt to, to, um, to capture some of the stories of, the, of this response, this collective response through this network, also an attempt to see how the learnings from this work in this very unique and somewhat exceptional moment um, can feed into um, a a, a new way of, of doing things in terms of the way we think about the relationship between the support for nurturing knowledge communities that is a big part of our work and the way that relates to the thriving of diverse people and communities. And, and, and that relationship was at play in these projects, um, even though the immediate, um, the, kind of the immediacy of the, of, the, of the response was about the provision of funds that could go to um, provide housing, food, um, technology assistance for students. I mean, you've, you've heard the wide range of things that the funding actually went to support, which was remarkable in and of itself. The, we were working, as you say, with scholars, with, with knowledge makers, and they were not, um, they were not removing themselves from their from their role as knowledge makers, so they were doing this work um, in in that um, in that capacity, and as they did so, then imagining how they could um, build new knowledge with with their community partners, co-produce that knowledge um, about this this moment. The other thing I think was, and again, this was Dr. Silver, um, our president. Um, 
encouraged this uh, and, and appreciate the way that she did that, that um, we were living through a moment that um, needed to be documented. And so that, that, that piece of the effort felt just as pressing and important um, as, um, as, the, as the provision of the direct support. And of course, it was being heavily documented, but, not, but in a way that was not always um, evenly distributed, right? So these communities that were being um, engaged um, probably not always as visible or their voices not always as audible as, as others. And so that, that piece of it felt um, important and pretty well aligned with our, with our mission. Yeah, I think when I think back, you know, you think of all of the, the celebrities, the popular music artists, all of these big kind of relief efforts that were organized. And, and a lot of what I've been hearing um, in these interviews is that people were looking more for those groups that, that had been slipping through the cracks, right, that weren't going to get relief from other places. And it seems like they were really able to, to reach out in the specificity of their context and locations to, to groups that, that, um, that really needed some, a little extra support. Um, with that in mind and with, uh, you know, we've heard a lot about lessons learned and challenges that people um, encountered during this time. Um, I'm wondering if you think back to your, to that, you know, March 5th, 2020 self, um, still in the office, didn't know what was coming. Uh, what advice would you, would you give that past version of yourself? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> maybe even to have gone a little bit bigger. I, I, you know, I don't think, we didn't realize, I don't think anyone did at that time, um, how long we were going to be isolated, many of us, um, how disruptive this pandemic was actually going to be. I mean, maybe there were, there, maybe there were some prognosticators who did, but certainly many of us didn't. And so I think given what I've seen in terms of the way that this work unfolded, um, I would have said, I would have explored whether we could have done more. Um, that's always, <laughs> that's always what you want to do in grant making. I mean, I, I, um, the great thing about our work is to be able to deliver the news that a, a new grant has been approved, and the worst part of the work is to be able to, is to be in the position of having to disappoint people who are, who who would really be doing wonderful work if the funds were there and are doing wonderful work, but would do more of it. Um, so that's one piece of it. What that would have meant in practice, I I I'd, I'd have to think a little bit more about. Um, You know, I, uh, to be, again, honestly, in that, in those early months, we were surviving, you know, and so um, we, I, I, some of the grantees have shared the way that they felt empowered by not having to have it all together, but being just given the green light to say, look, we want to do this with you. You're a trusted partner. Let's put this together and let's move it quickly. And that's what we did too with our own response. Um, later then we began to unfold other things that were also um, in response to the pandemic. And um, those grants had a little bit longer arc in terms of the development of the idea behind them and the way that they were um, unfolded. And I'm glad that we did that. Um, because it allowed us to come alongside these r rapid response grants um, to do some work that um, could be planned. <laughs> so I, I'm not opposed to planning. I mean, I, I, in fact, a lot of the work that I do with grantees is about the value of, of um, building out an idea about what it is you want to accomplish before the, the grant is um, put in motion um, and I do see a lot of value for that. I don't know what more we could have done in that moment to do that in this case, and I don't know whether that would have um, been beneficial. Um, I think a, a big benefit was the moving quickly. Um, you know, I, 
the dates that stick out most th for many of us in this period, in addition to, for me, March 5, which was my um, last day in the office in 2020, are May 25, 2020, which was the date that George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Um, and less than a year later, January 6, 2021. And neither of those um, events or what, um, or the or the consequences of them, what came after them, um, had, you know, I had any idea um, were coming, um, but they shaped that that pandemic period in a deep way, and I think in a way that we're still grappling with. And um, yeah, we we live our lives forward, but we understand backward. So I'm I'm part of this process that we're engaged in now is trying to understand what it is that we've done and with what implications. Um, and I don't know that we're trying to prepare for our next set of urgent needs grants um, for whatever might be coming next, but um, to find a way for this to inflect the work that we're doing at the intersection of community-driven knowledge-making and public scholarship. And... Um, and it does, does feel like the pandemic um, accelerated some, some trends that were already um, pretty substantially underway in, in higher education in the, in the institutions that we work with and um, brought, brought things to light, but also forced a kind of rethinking that I think we're still in the middle of. Yeah, I, 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 that, that resonates very much, I think, with a lot of us who who are in this place of, of, you know, what comes next and, and how can we re-envision or continue to envision a new way of doing things that, that holds on to this um, deep sense of community engagement. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I um, want to let you kind of think on one last question. Um, and particularly thinking about this as, as a conversation that will enter the archive, as something that will be available to, to future generations of scholars, to people down the road, to institutions in the future who are thinking back to, again, what was it about that time that was so special and what worked? Um, what would you want them to really take away about this moment and about this I mean, I feel like as much as it was a granting moment, it was an initiative, an emergency grant, but really it's become this community and this, this network um, of activation, of activating communities. Um, what do you hope to, to see or what would you want those future generations to take away? <laughs> Just a small question. A very small question to end on, something light. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that happened during the pandemic, which was also underway you know, in the sector in which I am located in philanthropy, was um, the understanding that philanthropic institutions needed to rethink the way they, they do things. And um, you know, pre pre appreciate the, the, the voices within our grantee community that um, push on that. And, uh, and there, are, there are some movements afoot for philanthropies to be more um, agile, um, adaptive, responsive, flexible, transparent. <laughs> There's a lot of important um, transformation that can happen within the world of philanthropy. Um, and I think this moments like this um, help, help point, point to that, the need for structural change, um, just like they point to the need for structural change within institutions of higher education, for example. Um, so that's that's more of a, a reflection on the the institutional uh, um, ecology for the work that unfolded here. I think um, in the context of this gathering here at the Fetzer Institute, um, which unlike the Luce Foundation organizes much of its grant making around the, the the idea of love, building the foundations for a loving world, the Luce Foundation has a different way of articulating its mission, um, but. 
one of the reflections that's come up recently and just in this last conversation that we had with some of the grantees is around the relationship between love and grief. And this was a period of grief. Um, the, um, the, the grieving of deaths due to the pandemic, um, the, the, the grieving of George Floyd's um, death um, in, in George Floyd Square in Minneapolis and around the world. Um, and it was one of the participants in this, this retreat said, um, quoting someone else, you can't grieve um, what you don't love. And, um, and so we don't, that's not a word that's comfortable coming out of the, the mouths of scholars of, of um, religion typically, and maybe theologians find it a little bit easier to, to use um, words like that to describe the motivations behind our work. But it, that kind of unsettling of the, of the way that we draw these boundaries between our, our, our personal and our professional lives, which was an experience for so many of us during the pandemic as those lives blended by virtue of our dislocation, um, fed into the work, I think, and in ways that were really exciting and productive. And so that piece of it is one that I will continue to be reflecting on personally. Um, uh, not working at the Fetzer Institute, I don't immediately have ways to articulate my, my work in terms of, of love, um, but it's an aspiration to find ways to make the kind of translation that's necessary to be motivated by something like love in doing the work that we do um, and to be challenged by the way that that is um, foreign to the way that we often conceive of um, our work and the limits of our work. So that's, that's a piece that I hope, that's a thread that I hope that we'll be, con you know, we'll continue to be able to pull. I think others have reflected on the way that there was a sort of opening to a different way of being in relation to one another. Um, our neighbors and, um, and those who um, we might have otherwise thought of as strangers. And um, I don't know how long that lasted or whether there are remnants of it that are still in circulation, but um, I think it's worth continuing to try to return to that element of the way that being dislocated also offered us an opportunity to be um, in different forms of relation with one another. That's really beautiful, and I, I thank you so much for um, sitting down with me today and having this conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you.